Anyway, first part, post-globalized context. First of all, just to tell you that I am not the only one to believe that globalization, as we know it now, might be over today. I mean, just take, for example, those examples all from 2020. Economist, maybe goodbye, globalization. Another uh, article here, globalization is dead, you know? Another article, which is a book this time, you know, The Globalization Paradox, saying that globalization is leading to reaffirmation of the locals against the global powers. And finally, something in French, because I am French, which is a magazine in French, which says maybe globalization is dead and now it's time for relocalization. Also, you know, last month was uh, the World Localization Day you know, with conferences inviting well-known people. Uh, and this month, uh, there were in Europe at least three conferences on the topic of post-globalization. So don't worry, guys. Uh, we are not uh, the only ones in our uh, little online island uh, speaking about this topic. And in fact, this is a growing uh, topic worldwide. Anyway, to, to start this first part, uh, I could have asked you straight, you know, uh, what do you think will happen in the next 10 years? Or how do you see your country or your company in 20 years from now? Or even better, what will happen to your global supply chains next year? But I will not do it this way because answers here are so difficult to find because we just don't know, you know? And so to, to imagine the future is a very important job, as we have seen. But to imagine the future is also a very difficult job. In fact, to imagine is a skill by itself, you know, a skill that we can work on and a skill that we can improve. Because in order to be able to imagine the future, which means to imagine something which is not existing yet, we need to take a step back on our own mindset first. And in order to take a step back on our own mindset, well, we need, we need to be challenged. And the objective of this third part is precisely to take a step back and to start challenging our opinions and values. How we do that? Well, as a very first step, uh, I think that what we need to know is what are our values and opinions, you know, what is our mindset here? And so let's try to, to, to express and define our values, opinions and mindset on this topic. Here comes activity number one. Here, I would like to know how you all here relate to globalization. In fact, I will just ask you, the participants, uh, to write on the discussion channel, you know, here, three, three or four uh, words, notions, values, emotions that you link with globalization. You know, when you think of globalization, what words come to your mind? What notions, what values, what emotions come to your mind? You think of them? You find them, you write them down, and we can try to discuss about them later. Okay, so please use the Zoom, Zoom chat. Open your Zoom chat and write what you uh, feel about globalization. What did you say? Values, impressions, thoughts, feelings? Names of people, whatever comes to okay. your mind. Okay. So, very interesting words. I am impressed, really, by the Japanese uh, audience. Uh, what we see here is that we have quite positive words and some uh, negative words, but the majority is quite uh, positive, uh, let's say, uh, when we see uh, easy access, uh, diversity, access to resource, uh, connecting all, etc. But we also have something like um, kind of unfairness, I'm a bit, a, a little fear, uh, money capitalism, 
uh, you know, eh? so um, less resilient to shocks. Uh, so it's it's kind of uh, let's say um, different uh, o o opinions or uh, relationship with globalization here. In fact, you know, this uh, this activity comes from a personal experience uh, which was quite shocking for me. Last year, I was invited to a private uh, gathering by a big Swedish company of furniture. You know what I mean? Uh, and there uh, I met all uh, the leading team of this company. That nice person, really. Uh, and, I, and I asked them the same question, you know, what words you relate with globalization? And the answer were mainly future, beautiful, peace, diversity, openness, travel, progress, positive aspect. One month after, you know, I am in front of uh, local communities of Sweden, Norway, and Greece for another project. And I, I ask them the same question, what words you relate with globalization? The words were risks, fear, uncertainty, and loss. So what does all of it say? It says, I guess, that we need to be aware, especially us, the corporate policy makers, who are quite open to the world, that we consider globalization in a really specific and positive way, that we consider globalization in a really different way than some other people. Let me come back here. You know, so yes, our own relationship with globalization is not the relationship of everyone with globalization. One example, opening borders, you know, for example, can also mean to lose a job or to lose identity. And it can also mean death for other people. Let's ask the indigenous tribes of the Amazon what they think of opening their territory to the Spanish people, uh, you know, a long time ago. So, you know, uh, based in fact on their experience, people are much more positive or negative towards globalization. They relate it with more positive or with more negative values. And corporate teams, I guess, really need, let's say, to be aware of that today. Because if for us, for me personally, globalization helps me to travel and to meet diversity we, and to have more free time, you know, for some others, the reality is less nice. Anyway, what we just did now, you know, uh, looks quite simple, but in fact, it's a crucial, I guess, it's a crucial step. I mean, this very first step of understanding that our mindset is just not the mindset of everyone, is in fact the only way to be able to start imagining the future. Because if we don't do that, we will just imagine the future we want. We will just imagine the future our mindset wants, the future that our mindset can only imagine. It's not the same. If, on the contrary, we go out of our mindset and context, then we open to more possibilities of imagination. Based on that, um, I would like to give you now my own skills, you know, my own tricks uh, that I use in my job when trying to imagine the future. Because in my job, uh, my main activity, in fact, uh, is to anticipate what will happen to this local community or what will happen to that local culture. And so I need skills of imagination and anticipation myself. And here, the very good idea, I guess, when trying to imagine what will come after globalization is to start considering globalization as an object that we can analyze, an object that we can touch. In other words, we need to desecrate globalization. French words, difficult words, which means not to consider globalization as something almost impossible to define, as a powerful process, as something we have to adapt 
to without even discussing or even as a god that we cannot challenge because what we cannot define we cannot control and because you know at the end of the day globalization is just a very specific context a context that never happened before and that might never happen later no more no less and on this point you know if companies and local governments maybe had thought like this way before maybe they would not be that worried or that extreme or that lost today anyway a second way a second trick a second way uh, to anticipate uh, let's say um, how can i say uh, what could have what could come after globalization is also to analyze the current consequences of globalization why because those consequences are right here right now and so they, they are much more easy to consider and analyze for us here i will go straight to the point we have been told since decades that globalization was going to lead to convergence to an economic social political and cultural convergence but i think i don't know if you agree but we just have to check the world news in order to see that globalization also leads today to come uh, to divergence you know to an economic social political and cultural divergence in fact and here is a crucial point for companies and corporate people it looks like globalization paradoxically is leading to the rise of values which are not global at all localness territory resilience authenticity diversity identity all of those are concepts which are gaining a lot of value today i mean consumers go local i go local i am sure you also go local today to summarize the children you know of uh, globalization were supposed to be even more globalized than their parents i take the bet that they won't be in my opinion indeed the focus the basis is already not global anymore and companies really need to start adapting to this new concept to this change of paradigm in order to be competitive in a near future however we cannot imagine the future by only taking bets or giving personal opinions so simple question now do you agree with me is it the end of globalization yes no uh, what is globalization uh, leading to let's make why not uh, a little poll and discuss then the results in fact now i will give you a list of concepts and you have to tell me if in your opinion the value of this concept is rising or decreasing today today in 2020 Be careful i mean it's not about if you like this concept or not it's about telling us if you think that this concept is generally gaining value or losing value today here is the um, uh, the, the summary uh, of it. yeah so in fact those concepts are simple concepts but it's not that easy uh, to answer examples again the borders uh, right now borders are i would say generally opening you know uh, i have been in tokyo thanks to peter david twice 50 years ago it would have been uh, much more uh, difficult you know it would have been something exceptional for me uh, to go uh, there uh, but also the world the borders today are i would say uh, closing so can you hear me yes yes okay the, the, the borders are also closing today you know so with trump bolsonaro etc so it's like a tension in fact of values it's very difficult today to find balanced point of view on these concepts or borders are paradise or borders are evil you know or uh, we have 
to save nature. If not, we will die. Or we don't care about nature at all. You know. So balance point of view right now are difficult uh, to to find. Some specialists say that today, the context of today is a global war of values. And it's funny that we say that because today I cannot change it. Wait a second. I will share again everything. Ah, it's not working. Ah, now it's funny that we speak about that because today, right? Today is the World Values Day. You know, and during the World Values Day, I tell you that today is a global war between values. You know, uh, a, a war between values of people who are more global, nomadic, and technologic, and people who are more local, settled, and traditional. This, whatever the country they live in. I could have asked the same question in France or in Sweden, in, uh, in Nigeria. I think the diversity of opinions will be the, 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 the same. So the tension is here. Myself, here, I, I would say, from my experience and my expertise that uh, globalization was say to make us all closer and closer. But I think that the last crisis uh, m should make us think again, the globalized era and its outcomes, you know, on, on the people. Maybe that a non-responsible globalization is a non-sustainable globalization. I am here saying that maybe the ways of globalizing the world are leading to the globalization of the world, to the deglobalization of the world. One question, would we have Trump without the global context? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So anyway, uh, the, the Polynesian here, since in their tradition and culture, uh, they speak about the difference between the people from the sea, which means people who take the boat in order to open to the world and take adventure without any borders, and the people from the trees, you know, the people who stay in the island because it protects them and it gives them food. And so today, the gap, you know, between the values of the two kinds of people is really, really increasing. To summarize everything here, globalization, in fact, when we analyze it, creates both extreme convergence and extreme divergence today. Globalization is a paradox because by opening the world, we standardize it. And by accessing the world, we also remove its main authenticity. So this is the, 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 the point of view that I can have myself on what values are rising today. Both values are rising, but it could lead to uh, a, a big uh, fight of, of, of values. So yeah, let's say that uh, this is the, the conclusion of the part uh, one. And the problem for us here is that, but who is finding themselves in the middle of this tension? Well, the companies. Part number two, post-globalized companies. The, the idea now is to, I would say, uh, try to consider what kind of companies might be the powerful and resilient companies in this kind of new context, and what kind of companies might not survive in such context. And here again, what is important for us, not our final conclusion, because we don't know exactly what will happen. What is important for us here is the process towards our conclusion, because it's the process that will make us improve our skills again in Prove our skills in opening our own mindset as well as imagining and anticipating the future for our company. Then to start this part and to use very corporate terms, the idea now is to think in terms of value creation and risk management for our companies in a post-globalized context. Why? Because 
those two notions of value creation and risk management might indeed change a lot in the next years. Why? Because create value and manage risk in a post-global world is not the same than create value and manage risk in a global world. Let's be a bit more concrete here. As we just saw, uh, we are right now in a context in which a lot of local people, local communities are increasingly willing to be independent respect to the global context. You know, we are slowly moving from a claim of individual freedom, you know, let's say who I am and what I want to a claim of collective freedom, who we are and what we want here. We, we can, for example, see this kind of new expectation in the last national political results in Brazil, US, Italy, UK, India, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also in the current community claims in the US, you know, saying our black community wants that. It's not about I want that. It's not the same. This is changing. But also, we can also uh, finally notice this kind of expectation uh, at very local levels through uh, circular economy processes. To summarize here <laughs> uh, with an image from the most uh, uh, global company ever, from my Big Mac, we will go to our Big Mac, you know, the Big Mac from here, the one which has been supplied locally with local workers and the ones which is respecting and engaging for the values of here. These for global companies might change everything because the values won't come anymore from the global and the risks won't come anymore from the global. Both values and risks are now mainly at local levels. You know, I saw in the, in the, in the, in the channel discussions, people speaking about uh, global supply chains. Indeed, this is happening. Uh, today and the last 10 years. Uh, I also saw last month on LinkedIn a lot of webinars about how European global companies are trying to adapt their global supply chains to the current context. But to be honest, I am afraid that what is happening doesn't need adaptation, but revolution. It's a total shift here. In other words, I mean here that the current change of paradigm of the world will require a change of paradigm on how companies consider the world and act in this world. To come back to the supply chains. Global supply chains just represent everyday more risks for global companies. I'm speaking here about technical risks you know, with a lot of, a lot of new taxes uh, from the US, China, India, etc. Also the risk of being dependent from other countries. We saw the issue with the masks. In France, we were depending from China and the people did not like, uh, did not like that. But I am also speaking here about ethical and environmental risks. Because global supply chains, they go against the new trendy value of localness. And because at some point, saying that we engage for the environment while creating here, producing there, and selling somewhere else might be not audible for consumers anymore. Just an example here. Uh, one super tanker, you know, the, the boat which carry products, you know, uh, we, and which represent global supply chains and also which represent sometimes uh, globalization. One bot is polluting like 12 million car. Yes, 12 millions. And so what you read right now uh, will be soon again, not audible for consumers anymore. Anyway, uh, the only fact to speak about all of this proves us one thing, I guess. 
the current the current global model is slowly losing its physical but also psychological influence on the people and when a model becomes obsolete and unpopular then we need to change it especially when we are a company here comes activity number three group discussions the idea now is uh, the fact let's say that we will all be divided into small groups of people for 15 or 10 or 15 minutes depending uh, the idea for you, the participants, is to uh, discuss about what I presented before. The values increasing is do you feel a tension? Uh, what is happening for the companies? Is my company fit uh, to this uh, new kind of world, etc., etc. Here are some, let's say, questions that can help you to, uh, to create a discussion into the small groups, like how to create value when we are a global company in a world which is localizing, not easy to answer. And also, what do you think will be the biggest risks and challenge for your company in a post COVID and localizing world? So yeah, maybe uh, Peter David, you can divide the people uh, into groups. I don't know how many people per group as you feel. Okay, so 12 people chose number two. Globalization is seriously challenged, but global corporations are resilient. And number four, people are getting ever more global day by day, whether they uh, or not they want to. So we need global strategies. And one person saying the last one. <laughs> Sorry, what is this French guy talking about? <laughs> okay. Hmm. Yes. So yeah, here I can see that in in Japan. Let's say that uh, we are positive towards globalization, also maybe because you are some of the countries uh, that we can call winners of globalization in terms of exportation, etc. Maybe it's not the same in France. For example, I did the same question with French corporation and they were quite more uh, negative or at least saying that, okay, we have to adapt to globalization, it's changing, etc. So it's, uh, it's uh, inter interesting. Uh, also, I see that one person answered that the idea is not to know what will happen exactly, is to have an influence on what will happen, you know, uh, to focus on what we want, etc. And I focus on this answer because it's the bit uh, what uh, will come next, if I may. Uh, so now let me show you what, because next, let's say, uh, I, I will tell you that based on those thoughts that you had in the debates and how we can adapt to the current change and what will happen. Uh, now, I, I would like to show you the examples of some European and US companies, you know, on how they reacted themselves to those changes uh, in, in, in the world. Uh, because we can see it better now, I guess the, the current world is about people who want uh, more local or national also uh, against people who are who want more global or who rely more uh, on, on the global. Uh, as they say in the UK, uh, uh, today is a fight between the somewhere and the anywhere, to summarize briefly, you know. And so here in this fight, an increasing number of global companies already decided to act. Mm -hmm. What they did? Well, in fact, they choose their side, I would say. They decided to support the more global, nomadic, and open side. They, so they decided to support only one side, you know, of this, uh, of this fight, I would say. And they do it officially. I mean, it, it's not my opinion here. That's the question. Nike, Ben & Jerry's, uh, Uber Eats, you know, Patagonia, Etc. 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 All of those uh, companies are becoming what we can say uh, activist companies. You know, this is a trendy world: activist global companies. So here you can see uh, Nike uh, supporting uh, Black uh, Lives uh, Matter. Uh, we can also uh, be activist against Trump. So they say we have to vote, go to vote, which means in fact go to vote uh, against Trump. Uh, some of Euro European companies are also activists against 
the, the Brexit, they are committing for a world uh, without uh, borders or at least promoting universal uh, values and individual uh, di di diversity. Here, for example, is Patagonia, it's official, it's written, vote the households out, speaking about Trump, you know, uh, and I, this is another uh, from Uber Eats, support the black uh, owner uh, restaurant. So we can see here that those companies become activist companies, you know. My, my first comment here, this looks good, but the problem is that by, by doing so, you know, uh, those companies also go against the opinion of millions of other people of the world, you know, uh, the more local and traditional people or the, pop, the people who voted Trump, for example, uh, the people who are more afraid of globalization, so this kind of people. But in fact, and I work with some of them, so I, I know their mindset, uh, those companies just say to themselves, the world is now facing a huge shift, you know. We strongly believe that in this shift, in this fight, there is a side of the good and there is a side of the bad. And so it's our responsibility to act activism, to act and to support the side of the good against the bad. And so at the end of the day, those global companies just became political companies, which is something very new for the corporate world and for the world. I mean, co companies not focusing on the needs of the majority, but focusing on what they want for the world. This is very new, focus on what we want for the world. And here I come back to the answer to the poll. It's not about focusing on what will happen, it's focusing on how we can influence what will happen. So focusing on what we want for the world. And here my question is, but why they exactly do that? You know, why they make this strategy? Because it's also a strategy. Well, first of all, because they rely on their global supply chains, you know, and on their global sales. And so they say, if the, go the world goes uh, 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 local, or closes its border, uh, that is the end for us, for the global companies. Simple answer. But there is a more deep uh, reasons of such political uh, corporate policies. The reason, I guess, can be found in the corporate world itself. You know, in, in the corporate world of today, the corporate policy makers, we, increasingly share the same political opinions, especially in the US and Europe. It's a fact, they are almost citizens of the world, digital nomads, uh, open people, etc. And this, whatever uh, the global company they work for. I mean, uh, we can notice it when uh, we see, for example, that the sustainability directors exchange very often position among themselves. You know, they go from this company to that company and so on. And they can do it that easily because precisely most of the teams of the global companies share the same values and opinions. So they are like interchangeable. You see my point. Anyway, this is uh, what I call here, uh, wait a second, yes, a trap. Because this homogeneity has consequences. We. The, the, the corporate policy makers live in our bubble, you know, we meet our twins, at least in Europe, because this is the context I know, we meet our twins every day, you know, we auto congratulate each other on our actions. And at the end of the day, this closed context is making us closing our eyes on what is happening in the world and on what we do in the world. I see again the answer of the poll. Globalization is here, we have to be more global. Wait a minute, this is what you see in your context. But if you meet some local communities here in Greece, what they think of globalization, I, it depends, you know, it, it really depends on the context we, we live here. It is indeed, I guess, and I am part of it, so I, I can speak freely, it's indeed more easy to persuade yourself that you are right that you do the good 
if all the people around you share the same ideas and ideals, to make it simple and funny, uh, even if those corporate leading teams speak very often about diversity, they most of the time think, dress, eat, live, and vote the same. Anyway, this growing corporate bubble makes us consider the world with a mask. Masks is trendy today, but here it's a mask of our opinions and sometimes of our opin uh, political opinions. We indeed cannot take a step back on our mindset since we are not in contact with other mindset. Result of that consequences, the gaps between we, the corporate policymakers, and the rest of the world is increasing today, you know, economic, socially, politically, etc. And here comes uh, the last activity uh, for, for today, which is uh, quite uh, simple, I would say. Uh, how do you feel with that? I mean, with what I just say, I try also to challenge the mindset, you know. Um, this activity is quite simple. Uh, we make small groups again for five or 10 minutes, no more. And uh, you, the participants, have to take position on the topic of activist company. How do you feel? about it? Do you want the same for your company? Do you think that your global company is an activist company and why? And so you can make debates on the topic. I hope it will be the diversity of opinion. You can, for example, say at the start that uh, if you are uh, in favor or against uh, those activist companies, not for political reasons, but for strategic reasons, and then you can uh, uh, debate and we will, uh, let's say, uh, debate uh, together at, at the end. Let's make the last poll. Are you in favor or not of uh, political and activist companies? Uh, it's quite easy question. I just want to check some results. So please make the poll and after we will make the conclusion. Activist company, what do you think about it? お、的なこう立ち位置、明確な立ち位置を取る会社はどう思いますかということですが、let's see what people think. Okay. And there is no correct answer, so whatever you think is okay. Yes, whatever you think is okay. <laughs> Eight people, nine people, voting ten people, okay. 11, okay. Anybody more? A few more people voting or maybe not? I think we understand. It's quite balanced, let's say. Yes, okay. This is the result, yes. So, the it's quite balanced. It's yes. nice. Okay. It's, it's uh, maybe the, the also the, the Japanese culture, which is like that. If I ask French people, it would be, or I am totally for, <laughs> or I am totally uh, against, I mean, you know how we how we are. Yes, okay. Anyway, maybe we don't have a lot of time. Uh, as you told me, maybe we could uh, go straight to the the, the, the conclusion. Um, mm -hmm. What, yes, what do you think? Yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Can you? Uh, yes, it's uh, uh, about you know the um, uh, Peter David asked me the 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 three main important thing to do for me. You know, in such paradoxical and strange context when, when we are a, a global company. So I would say first uh, to focus on localness, uh, not only because it's my expertise, but uh, I'm speaking here about to, to focus on the values, the lifestyles, the needs and the expectation, which are the ones of the local communities, which are the ones of the targeted peoples, not ours. First of all, because uh, in a localizing world, the local culture uh, will play a major uh, role uh, because they are the main factor uh, and uh, representation of uh, localness. And so the idea here is to engage for the local communities, but through their own mindset and not through our my own mindset, you know, and not in order to satisfy not myself in what I do, but the targeted people. Sometimes we always have to remember that. Second, I will say a, a, a tip 
would be to get closer to local uh, governments, cities, regions, especially. Because uh, in the world of today, uh, the power and the influence on the government, on the people, uh, is decreasing, you know? And so the people like us cannot really rely only anymore on public policies in order to develop our societies. The consumer of tomorrow might look for, uh, uh, might look, let's say, in, in other stakeholders what they cannot find anymore in the governments. In other words, the social and societal needs will increasingly need and have to be tackled by corporate organization. And so, yes, the companies of tomorrow will have to be political, but political can mean two things. One, propose solutions to challenges according to the local needs and expectations. And second, can also mean to spread your own ideology worldwide without really respecting the other opinions and local expectations. It's not the same at all. And finally, uh, my last, uh, I would say, uh, opinion on that is uh, to stop thinking in terms of good versus bad. Why? Because being good and bad, in fact, is just a matter of, of, of context, of territory, of timing, of mindset. You know, what is good today might be not good tomorrow. What is bad here might be good uh, there. Why? Because people, when they start being convinced that they do the good, they start being dangerous because they start saying to themselves, I do the good, then I am allowed to do whatever I want for the good. Never forget that no one wakes up in the morning and says to himself or herself, I will be a bad person today. We all think that we do the good, but we don't do all the good. And so I guess that every corporate policymaker should ask himself or herself at least once a week, yes, once a week, do I want to save the world or do I want to save my world, my values, my opinions, my lifestyles? It's not the same. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And Franz, if you stop sharing for a second, and we can just say goodbye to everybody. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. If I can do okay. it. Yes. <laughs> ah, wait, okay. Very good. Now I want to just have the gallery. And then we say thank you to France. This is a very important theme. It can be complicated, of course, sometimes, but something we need to think about right now. And I think in Japan, like the media might not cover it so much. So we need to think deeply about these things as we move into a localizing and also globalizing world at the same time. So uh, France has thought of a lot about it. So please engage also with France, maybe I, I can connect you. Uh, but thank you for joining today. I'm very, very happy that you were here. Uh, thank, you. And thank you to France for all your preparation. And uh, thank you for your great work with uh, NLU. And thank you very much. Next, we look forward thank to the you. next courses on NLU. Thank you very much also for uh, uh, all participating to the polls, etc. It was uh, great also for me to know the, your opinion uh, through a Japanese context uh, on those uh, topics. I am happy to talk anytime through NLU and through myself as a person as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much and bye-bye. See you again bye -bye. soon. Thank you, bye-bye.